just listen. To success in the field, which I think is a brilliant one. Yes. Uh, I think we're live. Ian Shippy, thank you very much for joining me today. What it's a pleasure, a, Nick. It's absolutely an honor to to have you here and to talk to you because I've seen you as a bit of a mentor and an example to follow in in your career and in my short career. So, I'm going to jump into your brain a little bit, and I hope uh, people enjoy our conversation. That's an absolute pleasure, and great to be with you, Nick. So, um, just a little bit about your background. Um, you were born and bred in Johannesburg, am I right? Yeah, so raised in Johannesburg. Um, interestingly, um, I'm the second of four boys, and my folks did two stints working in London when they were in their 20s. So, my older brother was born in London, I was born here, then they went back for a stint, but then I, I was back here by grade one anyway. So, um, so fourth generation South African, but my folks had some adventures in their twenties. But I was raised in in Joburg, yeah. And and which schools did you go to? So yeah, Nick, pertinent questions because I um, was very privileged to live in in a suburb called uh, Parkview, nestled in by the Zoo Lake and and the Zoo in Johannesburg. And I went through the Parkview Primary School and. As you know, just even as you sent me questions, just reflecting on that, and I'd almost said it was like a family, and and three masters in particular, um, Adrian Henning, um, Peter Moll, and Liam Lee, coached me for various sports through my journey through high school. But they were like uncles to me. It was incredibly. So it was it was a balance between a nurturing environment, but. We fell in love with our sport there and a remarkable environment in, in the primary school. Then I had grade eight down in Maritzburg College. Uh, and then um, I moved back to Johannesburg and had a great run at, at four years of Parktown Boys. And um, in that period, obviously, you've you've got a big love for sports. So is that where your your sport started to take shape or, or did you not play much sport at school? No, I, I majored in sport at school. Got a, got a decent enough metric, but I majored on the sports field. And uh, yeah, so shaped me immensely. I, yeah, right through primary school, it was all sort of being nurtured. And yeah, I think all through school, but last few years, incredible. Um, actually picked up an injury, so I had to move from rugby to hockey. Parktown boys at that stage were playing some incredible hockey. Was fortunate enough to play in the provincial side of matric, so and had an amazing coach. But Nick um, also captained cricket teams, actually from grade nine through to first team captain. And so I loved batting in the upper order, bowling off spin, but loved the strategy side. So I guess fell in love with with leading teams. Uh, on the cricket field at high school and you you work in leadership at the moment you, you've got a lot of work done with with businesses and sports teams in cultivating leadership am i right is that kind of the focus yeah so nick there are different threads to what i'm doing so maybe let me comment on the business side so transitioned a number of years ago and i worked in an amazing company called change partners for four years and we were doing um executive coaching and uh, a remarkable team of people. So I guess what we try and do is um, uh, yeah, come in as consultants and add a dimension to the workplace. So enjoy connecting with leaders. Um, but having said leaders, I, I feel comfortable working right through the different stratas of an organization because I have huge honor and respect for those at the total skills call face of something, but feel comfortable in a boardroom or sitting with a CEO um, to maybe try and uh, listen in and, and build a relationship with them to get some perspective going, yeah. Did you study in in, in psychology or leadership or, or maybe some OD work? Yeah. yeah, so Nick, that's an interesting one. My undergrad was in psychology, uh, so I'm not a sports psychologist, prefer, but more a peak performance coach because my undergrad hadn't been psychology, so I had to build it differently. But I've got a master's degree in organizational leadership, first-generation online degree, which is so familiar to us now, but did that 
way back in uh, 2000 through Regent University, Virginia Beach in, in the States. So, yeah, leadership organizations. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was, I just kept seeding and fueling and, and mentoring uh, my leadership journey. Had some great professors that I was under there. So I, I've got a master's in organizational leadership and I keep studying every year. I'm up to something, but I've done that too, yeah. Are you studying at the moment? I actually, right now, I'm not on an official course right now, but that's rare. But I'm, st- um, but I'm writing, and I'm delivering some new courses at Varsity, so I'm reading extensively. But on the sports uh, and applied sports psychology side, I studied under Dr. Patrick Cohen in 2010. And that studying translated into a mentorship relationship for a number of years. So not only in a class environment, but environment, but a one-on-one and read extensively. And then last year, I studied through the Barcelona Innovation Hub, yeah. which was fantastic. Um, just getting into the Spanish mind, as we know how powerful they are in sport. <laughs> yeah. So I did, I did four months through them last year. Okay, so... Your applied sports psychology, you studied through or under Doc Pat Cohen mm. from from the States. And at the moment, you are presenting an online course in this. So actually, actually in a few spaces. So the one course I, I do through HFPA, that is Doc Cohen's material. So he, he rightly gets royalty on that. And HFPA are my education partner there. But I also lecture that at SACAP. And, and independently. So I guess I'm in a few different streams passionate about the subject. And I think in South Africa, we need to get it out as much as possible. So a few doors are open for me there. So I'm, I'm doing that in a few different spaces. Can we talk about the, the education about that quickly? Because growing up, I've always wanted to be a sports psychologist, but finding the, the studying pathway for that is almost non-existent. I did sports psychology by doing sports science and then masters in psychology but there's actually no registration in south africa as a sports psychologist so can you talk about sports psychology in south africa a little bit and the education and what we're lacking and things so nick i think you did right as people yeah try and stumble across the right path there to do that so yeah and and you also want to be close to faculties where it's not just academic but it's pragmatic and it's alive um you know I think of some of our hubs, Stellenbosch, Poch, uh, Pretoria, some of the hubs of those high-performance centers. So you almost want academia and, and the practical side to, to bleed into one another. But coming back to your question, so yeah, in South Africa, one would, to be a sports psychologist, you would you'd either need to, you'd need to do psychology and come out as an educational psychologist, a, a clinical or a counseling psychologist, and then build upon that. The challenge is you have to build the sports leg as well as you did with your sports science. So, so yeah, depending, some other countries, you're going to sit in a, in a, in a sports psych faculty and, and get those, those mentors and professors to be breathing that sports out all over you. But in South Africa, which is mostly appropriate, you would be in the clinical or counseling space. So you're going to have to delve in and get that sports knowledge somewhere. So there's not a nice classical clear path to it. Um, yeah, so you sort of hack your way through the system a bit. <laughs> is that is that the the gap you're trying to fill with the with the online teaching, or are you just doing that because it's something you love? So, so both, both a passion for it, and 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 Dick, what are my passions? I I think we need people at, at all levels, and that's why I sat at the feet of Doc Cohen for years. Um, Doc Cohen must be touching 60 now. So he was a first-generation American sports psychologist. So those were some of the generational guys who did their PhDs in that yeah. and before it could even be offered as a, a career, at least a, a study path at university. So I feel we need it at all levels in South Africa. So HFPA is tucked in at the college level, below the university yeah. level. So I think my passion in the South African context is I'm convinced that if we can give some insights to both players and to coaches, we can build upon our foundation. So as South Africans, I think we've always honored the te- technical aspect of our sports. And I think if you track it back decades and decades, um, I think there were big transitions in the 70s and 80s uh, last century as um, strength and conditioning and nutrition came in. So 
you know, it, it, if you were a cricketer in the 1980s, you, were, you would have been a freak like Kepler vessels to be in shape and in condition. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, so in the 90s, strength and conditioning started coming in, the, nutri- the nutritional piece. So if South Africans, if, you know, if we could add to our technical piece, now our, we've been immersed in strength and conditioning and nutrition for the last while, but, but I think there's still a missing component on, on the psychology piece, yeah. A couple of, of guys have, have started to pop up that when when I look for people to connect with in this field, uh, yourself was one of them early in my career, and then Tom Dawson Squibb. Everyone kind of knew about Paddy Upton, but he started as a you know strength conditioning coach, um, and then we had someone like Mike Horn working with the Proteas um, on on different things, but in my opinion, that touched on sports psychology. Um, also, when you look at the international teams, um, someone like the Western Province rugby team never had someone, but now they've got Tom working with them quite regularly. So do you think it's something that's pe- that people are starting to pick up on, like the nutrition, like the, the strength and conditioning? Definitely, uh, definitely picking up on it, um, but still maybe not there enough. And so if you go back to Jake White's chapter of Leading the Springboks, he took over in 04. But I think soon after that time, brought Henning Gierke in. Now, he's a rare bird as well because he was an extraordinary middle distance athlete. So Henning's also actually touching 60 or so. So even in the apartheid era, was was a, 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 a national athlete, but also a psychologist. So he had the sports background himself and had those put together. But Jake put a value on that. I mean, Henning was part of the full-time team. Yeah. So so that's... That's even 15 years back. Yeah. And that, that was probably the first time we've heard of that in South Africa, a full-time part of the team psychologist. Uh, Nick, you're mostly right. Um, some of it, on the full, possibly on the full-time side, it's sometimes, I don't know all the details, you know, when someone's working with the Sharks or Western Province or whatever, I'm not quite sure whether they do five, 10 hours a week or whether they do that a lot. But Henning, Henning really had a, a, a large role, yeah. a focused role there with the box, yeah. And looking at the Olympics, I was chatting to Andrea Daleave just earlier this week and he was saying they, had, they, they made some people available for the latest, for the 2016 one, where you could go to someone in Durban or Joburg, wherever you were living, and because your contract paid for your medical aid, it would cover if they were a, a, psych- a qualified psychologist. But comparing that to Australia, they had something like 12 sports psychologists that went with them to the Olympics. So it's, we're quite far behind, it seems, in that, in that space. Yeah, and I think it... it, it I think we're behind in the sports science uh, space. I think when you look at the macro picture, if you look at, if, if we move away from sport for a moment, just to mental health in the country, you know, so many of South Africans battled with mental health. So I, I guess sport seems like a, a real niche in that and yeah. compared to the masses who are battling um, with issues. But as you said, the, the Aussies um, really on the forefront. I, I know two dear South African friends who did th- their sports psychology masters in Australia um, and then worked to the Western Australian Institute of Sport where a lot of Olympians were based. And I mean, she was, uh, Sarah was bemused. I think she went to her first hockey session and they even had a podiatrist dedicated. Oh, so, wow. so you not only did they have the sports psych, but you had multiple specialist coaches. So Australia mostly at the one end of the continuum and we're, and we're, we could be, we could be much more advanced in that space. Yeah. Is that due to a lack of funding, do you think, or lack of just the need for it? Because we, we seem to be focusing so much on, on coaching with our tactical side of things. All our coaches are very tactical and, and it's all about strength conditioning. We always have the strongest team or the fittest team at the World Cup, but the rest of it's far behind. So do you think that's just a lack of awareness and the, the feeling that we don't need it? Or do you think it's a funding problem? Actually both. I think there's a growing education. As we said, you, you had Jake White, your progressive. But remember how pro- progressive Jake was that he had Eddie Jones coming in as an assistant yeah. church, so, uh, assistant coach, not worrying about national boundaries or taboos or things like that. He, he knew he wanted the best minds there. So 
Um, a lot of people, so I think quite a few of the coaches, I know the, I know the Lions have someone who comes and does 10, 15 hours a week with them. So there's that, but funding as well. Uh, but I think if, you know, if the value is seen there and what other coaches have done is that maybe they haven't got a sports psych in, but the coach themselves yes. has has read extensively, done a lot in that space. So, or the coaching team, so that they they sort of massaging it into into the dough through that way. Yeah. My, I mean, I think there's definitely space for sports psychologists everywhere, but my opinion is that because of so many international and 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 you know county teams, provincial teams don't have the funding to have a full-time guy coming in or even part-time. It's important for us to educate our coaches. I think a guy like Eddie Jones does it quite naturally. Maybe someone like Rossi, just because of his good people skills, he, he manages to play that role. Um, so through education and things, maybe our coaches themselves should be upskilled in this in this space what do you think yeah and nick i totally agree with you and that's why um that's why i'm trying to spend time in that space because so as you know you did the course with me years ago so yeah if if i get the head of sport at a school head of cricket head of rugby that they've got they've got incredible influence so they've got dozens and dozens of coaches under them um so I was talking to one of our schools in the city the other day, and I think they're not one of the bigger schools, and they had 18 part-time hockey coaches on their books to coach their five years in favor of age groups. So imagine you've got the head of hockey or head of sport, who's, and that sort of disseminates through to multiple coaches. Yeah. So I think, I think what's lacking in the country as well is not just sports psychologists, but education. So I think that's what distinguishes Pat Cohen in, in certain ways is – some sports psychologists are after the top gig, so I get the job with with Chelsea or Arsenal or the Springboks or that. But a lot of those people are playing their cards close because they're protecting their IP, understandably, and want to hold the top job. But who are the mentors, the mothers, the fathers, and who are disseminating knowledge to grassroots? You know. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably the biggest issue is the the few that that we have that I look up to and try to follow. None of them are in education except yourself. They're all pretty much working with the top teams or with businesses and companies. And it's a little bit frustrating for me when I reach out and there's not a positive response back in terms of guest lecturing or or setting up a course or something. I've tried multiple times and you know, it's only your course that I that I ever came across that, that offers anything like this. So yeah, so I think if we could get into the education space, and that mostly might hit part of our South African psyche as well, Nick, so that we're talking about the sports psych space, but I've been immensely privileged. One of my best, we're talking about Parkview Primary earlier on. I I went through Parkview Primary with the guy, Richard Pithy. His dad uh, was one of my first cricket coaches. He was a South African pro tier cricketer. And I would spend a lot of Saturday mornings with the Wanderers and in the nets there. Richard um, taught in the UK and then an, an opening came up as a, he was a school teacher and then an opening came up for a cricket position in, in Canterbury in the South, South Island of New Zealand. And he's now worked his way up to, he's an HQ in Auckland. So he's head of cricket coaching, sort of everything below the black caps. So Richard and I converse a lot, and and he's introduced me to some key uh, Kiwi New Zealand people. There's an extraordinary sharing of knowledge there, though. So um, they are, they're incredibly generous, and feel that uh, as we collectively come together, we learn from one another. So not only maybe just sitting with the pros, but I don't know much sharing. We even have at a technical level amongst our coaches and things, where you can see. Um, yeah, I think I think the New Zealand guys, obviously we world champs at the moment, but there's something extraordinary happening there on them agreeing at a national level that a kid from five to eight needs to master these skills, then that. So so I think there's so much opportunity to collaborate and get on the same page and learn things, yeah. The the all black rugby team, they had a guy or they still have a guy, I think, Gilbert Inoka. Yeah. And he's been around for more than fifteen maybe 20 years absolutely um so that was also quite early in the in the sports psychology space that they 
decided to go with someone like that and uh, and they've kept him they've, they've with with different coaches same guy has stayed around and i think someone like that plays a big role in mentoring not only the players but the coaches as well and i want to use that as a segue to our, our question on on mentorship so you've been a mentor to a lot of professional sportsmen and i'll allow you to to speak about that but what role does mentorship play in a professional field Nick, I, I think it's colossal. And um, again, because of the wonder and the how fragile our nation is still in so many ways, and these are also global aspects as well, but uh, I think mentors can come into a space. You can, um, because there's such a gigantic jump from school sport to university level sport to, to the top stuff, even if you've had the most incredible family foundations and things, you need people around you um, making those transitions. If you've had the greatest launch into life. Um, um, but if you, if you take someone who hasn't had involved parents, hasn't had mentors involved, how much more so? So, you know, we'll, we'll get into it just now, working with the SA hockey team, uh, working with the Springback rugby team for some time. So a lot of those conversations aren't necessarily sport related, but they're occupying a player's mind. They're life related. And it's very hard to give your focus to what's taking place on the field when, when so much of other life is buzzing around in your head. So I think I'm a huge believer in generational exchange and mentorship here. The, the mentorship at a, at a young person's age or age groups when, when they 13, 14, up until 18, they're going through a lot of life changes naturally and, and parents are there most of the time and even when they're not, teachers and coaches can play that role. But once you become an adult, who, who do players look to for mentors? Yeah, very true. And again, let's maybe just take something out of the New Zealand book. And we must come to people like Johan Ackerman just now in our conversation as well, who's a real father figure to many of the Lions. But I, uh, I spoke uh, last year. Sorry about that. That's fine. Last year, as I said, through Richard Pithy, I've, I've been introduced to some leading um, New Zealand sportsmen and and managers. So when the Crusaders were out here last year, and I th I think the Crusaders have won three in a row, Super Rugby, yeah. have they? Um, they were out here last year um, playing the Bulls in Pretoria, and I was very privileged to have time with Shane Fletcher, their manager. And you, if you just look at how strate strategic the Crusaders are, so Shane Fletcher, school teacher, rugby, lover of rugby, a leading headmaster in Christchurch. But they saw the value of taking a man of that caliber and bringing him into the Crusaders. So he's on tour with... He's, he's full-time employed by the Crusaders. Yeah. Obviously does the gritty work by booking flights and management and things like that. But he's, he's there. So on an international flight, on a bus trip, in a change room, in a hotel room, there's a, a mental figure to bounce off. So they're not just getting the best logistics person to manage their management. They are strategically employing someone who's going to have a much, much wider impact on the team. And and that combined with someone like Scott Robertson, the head coach, is a great combination because he's not only been a player himself as well, but he's also quite young, so he can relate well with the players. And I think any team, and maybe you can touch on this, any team that we've seen that's been successful has some sort of combination between coaches and, and other role players that are mentors, including Johan Ackermann and I think Rossi Erasmus and those guys. So... Absolutely, and I and I think this gets to to the bigger picture. So, um, going back to the Western Australian uh, example, and uh, I think I incorrectly I said it's actually Heather Heather Bain. So Heather worked I think with three cycles of Olympic athletes: um, Athens, Beijing, and London. I think, and she said she's a psychologist and uh, full full clinical psychologist, but also a sports psych. And she said in the Olympic village there, um, she was mainly dealing with personal issues in young adults. And uh, she was there and present for them in, in an incredible way. So we need to know how to optimize 
uh, the mental and the emotional aspect of sport to complement our skills, our conditioning, and um, our strategy. But uh, th- there's a there's a whole human person out there, and if you're not catering for that, then then you're not catering for the athlete per se. Yeah, I think that's something a lot of people miss when we watch international sports is we forget that those are just people. As soon as they leave that field, their their life goes back to normal as as if though it's ours. The, I was watching a documentary on Oscar Pistorius and uh, if we forget, let's go to his past when he was an athlete um, seconds before he had to get onto the podium to receive his medal at the London 2012 I think or maybe it was 2016 no it must have been 2012 um, he was on the phone to his girlfriend and they were having a fight and they were, you know, he was crying and I checked with Andrea who was there and Andrea says he couldn't understand because it's it's the truth. He was on his phone and, and in tears seconds before getting his, you know, his Olympic medal. And I think, I think athletes are under pressure because they have to deal with those things and then put up this image of, of who they supposed to be on, on TV and, and show up and be a teammate and all those things. And if you don't have someone that's been there or mentor, then it, it kind of, it's, it's destined to fail, in my opinion. Definitely, and look. If you look at let's let's look at maybe a certain route to stardom in sport. Um, often, for those incredible individuals, they they are starting to shine late teens, early twenties. So they've transitioned from you know maybe uh, elite athlete, but maybe playing SA schools, maybe shining on the American scene, then getting a college or university bursary, and then suddenly that just then catapults um, from having no money in their pockets. Uh, some of them can find themselves driving a sponsored car um, with cash in their pocket and things. And I think there are not a lot of parallels in the workplace and test unless you're a freaky entrepreneur and break out early and, and earn bucks. Um, but a lot of other people would have to move to a place of prominence through their 20s, through their 30s, into business management or things. Uh, obviously, you, you have some extraordinary entrepreneurs who crack it in the early 20s. So suddenly you escalated from from maybe being a, a schoolgirl star or schoolboy star, and then suddenly you're out on the stage. You, you've got, you used to just do social media. Now there are 20,000 followers watching your social media. <laughs> Uh, you can't pop into the local mug and bean without being recognized or things like that. So suddenly there's such an escalated role, not like unlike music celebrities or TV celebrities will go through. So it's just, you know, how do you handle that pressure? Who, who, do you, who do you call on and lean on in those crazy moments? One of the things I've been interested in is when athletes are, are traveling, sometimes away from home, three months, four months, and you've been in the space with athletes as a mentor when they are traveling. Um, what do they go through? What are some of the things you sit with them and, and talk talk through? What are the stresses besides missing the family and those things which are normal? What what else is there for an, for an athlete? Yeah, so um, next, so I was, in fact, on, on that side, I've only been in the team environment um, and and. But yeah, so traveling wise is mostly just with with the Springboks on a few occasions, and I guess they had a head start that they built such a family culture, so that they were there as brothers to lean upon. So that was an incredible starting position. You know, some people don't have that same gelling, so there's an isolation. You know, there's not yeah. that same friendship, so they were at an advantage like that. But Nick, there could be a range. Um, if someone's lost form and not making the starting lineup, they are fighting not down spiraling into a certain place a long trip can be very lonely if you're not making the starting lineup or out of form uh also if you pick up some sort of injury or you're in some sort of state of mental or physical recovery loneliness uh you've mentioned the family but let's not underestimate uh the the strain it puts on a marriage a relationship I was with Dr. Gavin Shang on Tuesday. I think I'm quoting him correctly. Gavin did uh, the medical doctor piece for the English cricket team when they were out now in South Africa. It's hard to even believe that it was the beginning of this year, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, but but he, he 
cared for the, the English team. And remember, they all broke out with that stomach bug and things yeah. like that. So he was hands-on there at that time. But he was saying that in some years, those guys have 300 nights away from home. <laughs> wow. So uh, translate that. You try and translate it, that into into keeping any marriage or or f- father, mother, child relationship going. So there, there are strains that really hit them, yeah. And how do, how do you approach that as a as the help, as the mentor or the coach? Can an athlete work through that or once it's hit, are you kind of accepting that their performance is going to be affected for the rest of the tour? Good question. Um, I, think, I think it all starts with that relational glue and chemistry initially. And, and if you're going to be a mentor or a sports psych or a peak performance coach, remember you're not just accessing, you're not just, you don't just have your eye on an athlete's physical condition or technical ability or strategy. Uh, if you're going to operate in that space, there has to be trust because if they're going to let you in to what's in their head space, they need to feel safe with you. Yeah. You know, otherwise you're not going to get the full picture from them. So that's so essential is, is that there is just that trust that you are a safe place, a confidential place. And if you're going to ref- want to refer outside, because obviously you need a team of people around an athlete. So um, we've just had one of our Olympic squad hockey guys have an operation this week. And we had to have a whole team of us around that medical space, mentorship, all that of do you go and undergo major surgery with the Olympics around the corner. Yeah. So, so having said that, getting into that space is a huge amount of trust and yeah, I think with technology now, you can, you know, if they if they have relational issues back home, possibly you can play a mediatory facilitatory role. You can jump onto Zooms and Skypes and you can address some of those issues. Some would need to be together in person, but I think you can do quite a bit. Um, and let's not forget the incredible um, men and, and women who marry international traveling athletes and what they take yeah, on. Yeah, for sure. So... I think you can you can work to a de- to a degree in that space, uh, but yeah, just depending on on the magnitude of the issue and and what it was, yeah. So can can anyone do that? Do you think anyone any type of personality can become a professional sportsman, or are these people that that can do this continuously and face those injuries and setbacks and come back and travel again and and get dropped out of the team? Is that a special type of person born that way or is that something anyone can do if they have enough talent? Nick, so I'm not a, you know, working in the leadership space as well, I'm, I'm not a believer that someone is just born in a certain place so you've got that all, you know, in the womb and, and you can live that out. But I believe there's a, a nurture environment combination there. So I, I believe that resilience can be built over time. I was talking to an international athlete last week who the first time they ventured to have a season overseas, because uh, uh, talking about us South Africans, very often it is very an- advantageous to spend a season overseas, no matter your sports code, to be in different weather conditions, uh, to get close to certain coaches, to get extraordinary levels of competition that you might not get here. So, and And this athlete was challenging just talking about how challenging it was to live away from home and things for a few years. So he, he built that resilience over time and he, but that was part of his journey that spilled over onto the field as well, because some of the personal resilience he was building um, showed up um, in, in mental strength on the field as well. So I, I believe that certain people can, um, can develop that, but there are high levels of resilience that are needed but I think you can develop that. And again, not on your own with this various support structures, coaches, environment that you're in. Yeah. And sometimes it's developed almost by accident. You know, some, so many athletes you find their life story had forced them into either there were no parents involved, or someone passed away at an early age, extreme poverty, and just those type of struggles, having to walk 20 kilometers to practice and back. I've heard so many of those stories with international athletes, um, particularly in something that requires a lot of of mental resilience. So UFC fighting, MMA fighting, or um, golf or tennis, you often find these athletes are 
come from a background that's almost shaped them to be resilient other than the practice that that you've just mentioned is that something that you could see in 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 your work as well or is that just uh something that the media portrays no i think definitely and and i think that shows up in life and on the sports field that that sometimes the adversity uh that shapes us shows up um in it, it could be if you take some of uh, sort of an economic or sociological picture of it um if you take california as an example that you've had an, an enormous amount of the asian american population uh that uh, the younger generation all graduating from varsity now but if you go back to the parent generation they were working as che- checkout stores as barbers as artisans in places that wouldn't need a, a formal uh, college education but they they landed in on american soil maybe with two suitcases in their hands and they made it happen but now they their daughters and sons are leading doctors and lawyers and things because they built a platform and they and they and they got their kids into university so i think that adversity really can shape us and yeah and i i, I think i i think it's well known that in 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 the soccer world um a lot of those guys come from tough hoods yeah, many people are, are tracking with netflix right now the last dance and yeah. and if you see those gentlemen, the Michael Jordans, and so those guys came from the projects. They came out of top. So I think it can bring a resilience to you, an absolute resilience that uh, that yeah that can show up on the sports field in, in a major way. Yeah, is that something that you find more in in um, individual sports, or is it something that you'll find in let's use South Africa specifically? I know but, uh, basketball in the last dance was something. A lot of the young teenagers, young boys like Michael Jackson used as a way to, to, it's all they had really. But in South Africa, we don't really have that in, let's say, cricket where there's so much opportunities for so many young people going through poverty to just go play cricket because it's all they have. Um, so do we find that in South Africa, the players that have made it thus far, the demographics are changing, but thus far, there's not as much resilience in our sportsmen, in our team, specifically the Proches and the Springboks, compared to the the Chicago Bulls from of Michael Jordan. It's a great question. You're getting me thinking. Yeah, and I'm going to talk on the spot. So sorry. Let me let me let me say maybe a reason for why the Proches seem to choke when without. I don't like using that word. I don't believe it, but I'm using it for the sake of the conversation. So Nick, I think there is a few factors, and I think just now we're going to get into the difference between individual and, and team or group sport. Um, so I want to contrast two things, um, you being a great bloom boy. So, so it'll be interesting it'll be interesting for someone to do a thesis. I think you had five players in, in the 2007 winning team. I think Paul Roos had five in the 2019 winning team. So it'd be fascinating to do a study of those. Yeah. So where those boys came from uh, psychologically, um, and 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 how there was nurture and things like that. So looking in the South African hockey squad right now, I think in the Olympic squad we've got six young men who've come out of Marisburg College um, in a squad at the moment. So I was drawing back the curtain on that just this week. And they were talking about the extraordinary relationship with the coach and a lot of those boys coming out of the boarding school and hostel and how the coach had, he was a border master in that house and he had an incredible amount of extra time as a hockey coach and as a mentor to them. So those we would see as more privileged situations. So this is Mike Boucher that you're Yeah, referring. that's Mike Boucher I'm talking about. So so if we're talking about a Grey Bloom, we're talking about uh, a Paul Ruiz, um at the incredible end of the spectrum in our South African schools, but boys from so many different backgrounds going to those schools. So um, there, I think there's, I believe in there being hot spots where, where talent is nurtured and, and developed, but you need to look at the ingredients of that. So 
there's so you have extraordinary school settings like that um and and remember privileged people aren't uh, you know aren't excluded from adversity you know so you'll have teenagers i'm sure we could go down to the the leading schools in our country right now both both the girls and boys schools and and are some of those who have never struggled uh, economically whether they would like to see more of their parents i'm not sure thousands would put up their hands that even though they're in the most elite high school maybe in the country they they long for more nurturing and support and things like that so so some kids with a great bank balance have had to have had to self-nurture peer nurture and things like that so they've built that but yeah i i think it's uh, as in life a person has to use what's at their disposal um to 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 build character you know and and but i think the point we started out at is that there is extraordinary character um that comes out of economic hardship and things like that but but we we see people from very privileged backgrounds excelling on the sports field as well so i don't think it's a a cookie cutter sort of approach but but at learning and tran- transitional points in their life did they take those lessons with them yeah that's it's it's just the problem i'm trying to solve at the moment is why it seems my my knowledge isn't that great on it but the the ba- the basketball and the and the football players that have all come out of this poverty driven world like Michael Jordan and and his teammates and that seems to be the 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 general story in those teams but when we look at our teams I mean if you just take AB de Villiers Fuff um, KG Rabada all of them went to very good all boys if not private elite sporting schools with all the facilities in the world it just seems there's a difference in the type of person that makes it professionally in our country and and overseas is that a, is that a fair nick i'm reflecting as as well as we chat so yeah i, I think that'll be a, a great study to look across um sort of some of those backgrounds so you've got your kgs and and fuffs and them uh but remember how well those guys have done on an international stage and IPL stage and things like that. Um, then, then I, yeah, you. So there are two, um, the Kasim brothers who are starring in the hockey team right now, bishops. who bishops. But I think they're on on bursaries and and out of uh, yeah. wouldn't have been able to pay their way through there with without the assistance and things like that. So there you've got that that combination of of extraordinary opportunity given to someone who wouldn't have been able to seize that. But then um, you've got Keenan Horn right now, who's the captain of the Western Province team. Keenan, who um, Western Province actually won the Interprovincial last year. So, you know, an incredible cluster of players. Last year have come out of Marty's there, um, but uh, spills over. Keenan didn't have that private school route and has had to fight his whole way. So... There's got There's you've got always, two pictures. You've got the Kasim brothers out of bishops, and you've got Keenan, just having to fight every single step of the way. Put them together in the same provincial team, a national team, and something sparks. Yeah. It would be interesting to do a study to find out the mental blueprint for yeah. for for having the the right set of mental skills to make it in whatever sport you are. Because we've seen countless of very very talented kids not make it, and then we've seen kids that aren't as talented that make it and then you get the combination which i think is like the kasim brothers who are unbelievably talented and they love the sports and they um you know they've they've had hardships in their life but they've had opportunity as well so i think maybe a blueprint could be developed around their personalities because they've got the combination of things we've spoken about do you have a, a theory on the mental blueprint for for making it as a professional or nothing yet Nick, you're asking probing questions and good questions. I, uh, yeah, a whole lot of things have to come together. So, um, so there would be coaching. We're doing a personal life story with the Olympic hockey squad right now. 
And it's interesting, we're saying who was the most influential coach in your teenage or university years. So coaches played an extraordinary role. If you get back into the rugby narrative, I think I'm correct in saying that Skalky Berger, John Smith, and Brian Abana were all 13 or 14, around about the time that Francois Pinot's team won. Something awakened in them yeah. as 13 or 14-year-olds. Interesting. Um, if you compare that to, to my teenage years, um, at the end of apartheid, the biggest thing was playing curry cup. So something wasn't awakened in my generation of players. There was no sight of South Africa re-entering. Then you have those guys, the 13 and 14-year-olds, in that impressionable age, um, seeing a, a Francois Pinar, Joel Stransky, a Chester Williams playing and what that can do for you. And I think there are, there are some studies going down which would be worth researching is what happens in the host nation hosting the Olympics. So if, if you take um, the UK, and I, 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 you wouldn't be able to quantify it, but it would be fascinating to see the spillover effect from hosting the London Olympics, the build-up years, building of stadiums. The, the, the UK team bagged a lot of medals. Um, yeah. at those Olympics. And, and it'll be interesting to see the spillover effect into, into society. Yeah. So I think timing, um, upbringing, coaching, teams you're part of, people you play with, um, but you're not going to take resilience out of the picture. You're not going to take needing to transition from just your technical, uh, physical skill set into mental spaces. But um, yeah, Nick, so I think we, can, and we need to look to patents and blueprints, but, but I think in our position, we can have those as guidelines, but we can't cut and paste because I could be sitting across uh, the room. So uh, an athlete I have the privilege of talking to three times a week is Tim Drummond, our national hockey coach. Um, someone put him in at, 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 at the at a very privileged side of the spectrum, he was he was sponsored through Hilton, so in one of the, the greatest schools in, in our country. But yet, if you see Tim as a 32-year-old, and the hunger he has, and I could tell you, I could point to you of how many core sessions he's doing a week, how many technical sessions, how many conditioning sessions he's doing. So there's one of the most privileged in the South African hockey squad, one of the hardest workers. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that the danger with blueprints is that I could be sitting across from a Tim Drummond or I could be sitting across the table from Keenan Horn, the captain and the vice captain of the team. They've had different, different upbringings. And if I'm just cutting and pasting a blueprint, I need to tune into you, what's going on in your head right now. Um, and so I think, I think they're guidelines and I think they're non-negotiable points, but, but I, I think as... Any psychologist, performance coach, you need to tune into that person, what's going on right now, um, and how you're going to help them navigate that. Because we might not be listening attentively enough if we're just following a blueprint. Can I ask you just to get that thing a little bit closer? Just when we move past it, it, it loses its sound. So that's perfect. So, sorry, just to get back to that. So, there's, there's something in every athlete, or in my opinion, there should be something in every athlete that that we can correlate between sports, regardless of, of what sports they're doing. But there's got to be something that takes them to that next level to be, to be able to go through so much sacrifice and and hardships in in missing out on family things, missing out on friends things, in order to be successful in your sport. Hard work is obviously one of them. But I've seen golf players specifically work hours and hours and hours and hours daily giving up everything they talented they've been talented since they were small or playing good golf since they were small but they still don't end up making it onto the, the tour they want so what is that little thing that we can correlate between athletes yeah so i think um i think i think one of the biggest ones is is managing pressure translating from a practice environment to a match environment. So coming back to our South African context, which is so rich, um, John T. Rhodes technically was not there as a number six batsman for the Proteas, would have not been a test player. What John T. brought 
to a match, how he could get into that space. Um, he was worth 20 or 30 runs before he had even got to the crease because of the runs he had saved in the field, his energy, his alertness, and things like that. Jonty made the transition. So going round, if you were just choosing number six batsman in the country, Jonty was mostly third, fourth, fifth in line. But what he brought, and Jonty could manage that pressure, manage those moments. But I, I haven't had the privilege of getting close to Jonty, but some say that that Jack Russell, that was such an eager beaver out there, running and fetching the bowler's cap and running to the umpire, apparently he would introvert immensely in the hotel afterwards. Okay. Gave his energy to supporters, gave his energy to his team, but he had to replenish. But Jonty worked on that. If you go back to his early career, being a Maritzburg boy, and, and those Peter Maritzburg boys would have played their top sport in Durban as they transitioned from school to, to the Sharks or the Dolphins. Jonty had to pull out the car over because he had stomach cramps constantly with with suffocating anxiety, oh, wow. had to pull the car over yeah. and, and catch his breath again. So Jonty pushed through some things there. Eh? Yeah. So there seems to be a, a correlation in, in overcoming something. I think when, we, when athletes learn how to overcome adversity, and in that adversity you can call it there's pressure involved, there's, there's consequences, there's sacrifices, all of those things. But if there's some sort of overcoming... Uh, a problem overcoming adversity we build that resilience that and we, it, maybe it shows them or shows the athlete when you overcome it you feel better about yourself you're more confident and and you're willing to find more challenges to overcome so i don't know if that maybe plays into what we've discussed with every example we've used we kind of come down to something that they've had to overcome Absolutely. And I, so I, I think a, a great line of questioning you've been following is, has a person taken life's adversity and, and been able to translate that to, to success on the field, which I think is a brilliant one. Yeah. Um, um, I, I was saying that a lot of people can't make that transition from practice to match. Getting into the coach's books, it's so hard to simulate that pressure, you see. So, I mean, you, you and I both love our cricket. It's an amaz- you can be an amazing batsman in the nets. It's, it's, smash anything you yeah. know there's no consequence you know but getting out of the middle and it's totally different you can kick it through the posts time and time again add a stu- stadium or a swirling wind a booing crowd and it becomes different so so one of the things and i think the reason some don't transition is that it's so difficult to simulate so um my wife and i watch the navy seals programs quite a bit and, and I, I often turn to lisa on the couch and say there's something here because very often i don't know if you've seen them um but they simulate conditions before they're going to go and get into a situation yeah. so if they're going to in america is a sensitive point this week uh, if you're listening yeah. to this podcast later it's <laughs> black lives matter is going down at the moment but but if they're going to break someone out let's say that some some people were hostage on a ship or something like that held by pirates they would get a model of that have a stopwatch running and they would have to run and simulate that it is so hard to simulate match conditions so 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 often it'll be interesting to measure the amount of practice hours and match hours it'll be interesting to see that um, because some have said the greatest way, so Steve Waugh, when he was shy of runs, would drop himself back to state cricket and have as much time at the crease for New South Wales as possible because Annette couldn't simulate that. So when he was battling for confidence at test level, he would, often as cricketers we say we need time in the middle, so he would get back to simulate being in the middle. So I think that could be one of the things is, um, and if you look back at our, at our privilege spectrum in South Africa, Nick, as you know, working with some of our elite teenage cricketers, uh, the the boys and girls at in the better school systems would have so many more matches. You know, some at a primary school level even play a midweek and a weekend match, and, and better competition, and better competition, as you said. So some some boys and girls are now starting to play representative cricket for their province, but they've had tons of times in the nets, but they haven't had enough match condition situations so i think some of those are the pieces the mental piece handling pressure but how do i create pressure and so we need these flight simulators um uh, of uh, of what it is to to simulate that pressure so that that i'm able to cope because we all know that something that falls by is i can 
I can practice something again and again, even have the, the muscle memory, but under crazy pressure, exam type pressure, uh, do I have techniques? And then I think that some of what we're trying to help our athletes with is w- I need to be self-aware enough, self-aware enough to recognize that obscene levels of pressure. And now, how do we handle it? And I think it was... Yeah, as guys were looking at the Springboks, as Rassi was forming the guys for the Japanese World Cup, I believe um, that it, it was some of the mature guys that were saying on is those those rugby teams get forged under pressure. So you, you can, you can you, you, I think we need to play the tests that, where we can experiment and, and throw the ball wide or things like that. So it's great to have a run out against number 10 in the world and things like that. But you are forged in the cauldron of playing the All Blacks, of playing the Aussies, of playing the English and, and talk, getting to team. That's where we need to know. It's one thing to have an individual s- set of skills, but can I trust you or if you're my number nine and I'm my number 10, how are we, how are we going to handle crazy pressure? And so I think those are some of the things is, are we able to make that transition? Um, and again, putting your thoughts together, some athletes maybe don't make it, but did they have the people in the corner? Did they have the mentors, the coaches to recognize talent, but, but know that that talent had to be put in the fire. So, so to, to forge that talent under pressure. Yeah. yeah. I just want to be mindful of your time because I know you've got to get away. Um, this is a great conversation, by the way, and where it's going. Thank you. I just want to redirect it to to the roles you played in this in the spaces with the Springboks at the 2007-2011 World Cups and around the, those times, and then now your role with the SA hockey side, and also maybe a bit of what you did with the Lions with you, Johan Akuma. So, so with the Springboks, it was really a, a mentorship role. It was not in performance psychology or things. It was being there as a mentor to many of them. That was on a voluntary basis. That was on a contract basis. That was a voluntary trust trust relationship. So I guess part of the conversation when we've been speaking about just being there for guys. Um, and we know the, the limelight, the Springboks are in South Africa and globally. So... Some of those gentlemen can't walk through a shopping mall without being uh, having a you know a request for thirty selfies and things. So that there's that sort of pressure. Um, so being there for them a lot um, and was privileged to get to two World Cups where yeah we could just some, have some off the field time and, and downtime and things like that. So yeah, and I think I cultivated those relationships over years and through trust. Um, and it's thread by thread. You know, it was. What we didn't have WhatsApp in those days, SMSing them before a Super Rugby game, SMSing them through an injury, just being there for them, not just, you know, if if we're shining at Edis Park, but twelve months a year, just building that. Con- I guess being consistently in their lives. Yeah. How did that relationship start though with some of those players? How did you get into that space in the, in the beginning? I, I actually fell into it. Um, so I had a friend who was assisting with them. Um, in in the Cape area, and uh, Jake White based based the team largely out of Johannesburg, um, was his home city, and we've got the privilege up here of of hosting Loftus and and Edis Park tests in in Gauteng. So the the box were up here a lot, and I was given a, a call just to say, won't won't you meet with some of the guys who just want some input? And so, yeah. It came my way, but then it was suddenly, what do you do in this space? They are celebs. How do you trust? So I don't think I asked anyone for a ticket for four or five years. <laughs> Didn't ask them for a photograph for five years because if they could sense that you were in there for something else, so I guess you had to prove that that you were authentic. You were there to support them. As the per- for the person, not for the sports. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and your your role with SA Hockey at the moment. So, SA Hockey at the moment, so Gareth Ewing is our coach, uh, and um, he is head of hockey at St. John's College in Johannesburg here as well, and I've been privileged to do some work at St. John's, and Gareth and I met there, and I was doing some work with different sports coaches and different sports codes, and inputting in the education piece piece to some of the St. John's people, and I think Gareth and I uh, forged some of that trust, Uh, Brett Tucker also a key guy in there, and... So what Gareth has asked me 
to assist with. There are two of us helping, I guess, in the cultural mental space. So actually, my 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 role really with hockey primarily is culture and leadership. So we have a leadership group of six guys. Um, between Europe and here and as I said we are spread out so building team when you're only together six or seven years seven weeks of the year is a different skill so a lot of that's over zoom and different threads whatsapp yeah. groups and things so I'm doing a lot on, on on leadership and team culture with them which bleeds over into performance as we said they're almost inseparable the type of environment you're in in performance and I work Craig Carolyn does more on the performance side but we drive together um, so I'm in weekly zoom calls with them I am in almost daily contact with the captain and and work very closely with, with the with the coach as well. And is that is the is the role you played at the Lions with Johan Ackermann similar to the Springbok role or more similar to the hockey role? More similar to the Springbok. So um, I had the privilege of of being with Johan on many occasions. We actually I'm going back just re- retracing the steps here. Um, Corbus Krobler, Baywatch Krobler, was the Lions captain for years. We were very close uh, friends, so I started playing a support role to him, and uh, and he he opened the door for me to play that support role to to some of them as well. So it was more like the Springbok role, being in a, in a mentor sort of role, and um, yeah, and so I walked oh, actually four or five years of Corbus's. Rain uh, playing an extraordinary role as number six of the Lions. I, I walked very closely with them through that time and, and some of the players close to him. So you've been involved with some of the coaches regarded as the best coaches we've ever had as, as in the rugby sphere with, with your, um, Johan Ackerman at the Lions and Jake White at the Springboks. Um, and I don't know the hockey coach you mentioned, but I'm assuming yeah, Ewing, yeah. He, they're doing quite well. So what could you take from each coach and what is something maybe you can share with, with people about in the coaching sphere? What, it, what, is, what makes them special? What do they do differently? Jake is so multifaceted. So I think an extraordinary strategist, uh, um, a man manager, a squad manager, uh, uh, a World Cup rugby coach has got I think when you count the physios and support staff up I think you've got 45 people that you're managing wow. including the press yeah. including selection the focus of a nation so so the pressure a, a World Cup uh, coaches under is, is extraordinary so man management Jake just excelled in so many areas uh, Strategically, you know, he started some of his days with the box as a video and an analyst, so he knew it technically, ex- technically, br- so Jake brilliant on so many levels. Um, yeah, man management. Um, Johan Ackerman had also strategy, but I think a culture builder and ex- people would describe the Lions as a family. Yeah. And so I think people love just being in that atmosphere. I wouldn't be surprised. I know Johan's on his way to Japan now, but. I'm not sure how many lines contracted to go over to Gloucester. I'm, I'm sure they wanted to be with Elkis. Yeah. So he's a father figure. He's a father figure. People like being close to him, an affirmer, a builder of men, a leader of men. So And also incredible strategically. And also that top rugby coach, remember you've got three or four coaches under you. You've got, depending on where your speciality is, you've got a scrum forwards coach, backline attack, defense coach, depending on, on where you sit. So you're managing players and, and you're managing coaches. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the SA hockey coach, limited resources, I'm assuming, compared to what Jake had and, and, and Akis had. How, how does he have to adapt to be able to play more roles because you can't have three physios like Jake had and, and 17 support coaches? Is it, is it something special or is it, or is it destined to fail? So these guys are extraordinary. They're extraordinary. They're not paid. Yeah. So they are running other coaching gigs to be able to do that gig. Um, so so extraordinary manager. You, know, you can imagine how much we do over the phone because that's all after hours. Yeah. So just extraordinary people. Um, also coordination skills. Gareth has been a student of the game for 20, 30 years. Worked his way up from school to under 21 coach. Not unlike Jake, gone through the whole system um, and observed astute technically. Uh, man management, astute technically, a study of the world game. 
So he's not just studied our structures, but where the Europeans have come up, the Aussies have come up, the Argentinians have come up in world hockey. So he's a student of the game, uh, knows what he wants, and he's, he's building a vision over time. But the hockey guys are extraordinary. So can we... Can the SA hockey team be successful with their limited resources if they have someone like that at, at the helm, or or what? What do we need at SA hockey? You say hockey, we need we need investment of funds to take us to another level hugely. So, for players and coaches, um, if we're more more professional, that will catapult us forward. But having said that, we've dropped to number 13, 14 in the world now. We were as high as eight, I think. A decade or so ago, but we're working at building that. But we're, yeah, I think we've got realistic goals. We're not seeing Tokyo as as a summit, but as a base camp. We're mindful of the Commonwealth Games cycle, but that Birmingham 2022, Paris Olympics 24. So we're building over time. So we're trying to build the foundation right now that that the next generation can inherit. What do you? How do you stay positive as a coach if you're not getting paid and you're not getting the support from the from the top brass in SA Sports and Sascock and things. I mean, if you could just compare what Jake had, or Jake has even now at the Bulls and what Rossi has at his hands to use and, and the hockey coaches, how do you stay positive? How do you stay motivated? An enormous challenge, you know, um, as, you, as you aren't rewarded for that, I think. I think the hockey's got extraordinary sets of relationships because it's, I guess you could compare that more to the volunteer movements in the world. Okay. Um, as opposed to the professional, I mean, these guys are playing like professionals, but they're not paid like professionals. So I think, I think, I think you'd have to look into some of the qualities that we see in volunteer movements to see, to see what's going down in hockey a bit at the moment. It's quite an interesting take. I haven't thought of it that way. And if it's something you're passionate about, and it's it's looked at in that in that from that perspective, that it's a volunteer movement, it actually makes a little bit more sense, you know. Um, I think, how are we doing for time now? I think, uh, do you need to get... I've got a few more minutes and then we'll have to wrap it up. All right, so let me get to some questions I like to ask most people. Um, what are some of your non-negotiables and daily routines? So daily routines, Nick, um, I'm a Christian, so um, that that is pivotal and core to my life, so that involves... That involves prayer. That would involve my reading space, and that's so. My my faith is is very dear and very precious to me. So that's a daily routine. I think daily routines would also be constantly exercising the mind. So I'm reading extensively, whether that's in sport or other areas of leadership or that. Engaging with my wife, she is she's uh, doing a master's degree at the moment. So engaging with brilliant minds, and I've got one right at home, and a 22 year old. And a twenty-year-old son, so that engagement around that, um, we're doing non-negotiables. So uh, or daily routines. Um, Nick, I'm trying to exercise a good five times a week. So if we weren't in lockdown, I would be playing two Masters hockey games a week wow. in a in a Monday and a Saturday league. So I yeah you know, I I still stay engaged in that. So exercise would be one. Yeah. So exercising spirit, uh, mind, and and body. Would be yeah you know, would be daily rhythms. Um, also, yeah, you know, I have have very strong relational base. So I believe in working within. I'm very community and I guess very African minded in that sense. I I'm I'm not a loner, but but hang with other people. Yeah. So those are some some of the hab habits and rhythms I'm in, Nick. Yeah. And um. What are some of the best books you've uh, you've read lately that you can recommend to people? So lately, um, I, I would say um, also a hot topic this week, but I read at the start of the year before we knew what was breaking, I read um, Michelle Obama's book, Becoming. So maybe getting back to our thread of struggle and things like that. And if you haven't dived into that, you know, her growing up in the south side of Chicago, an extraordinary story of what the Obamas did and are trying to be a voice right now so that's uh, that's out as a docky on netflix right now so drank deeply from that um, a, a book that i've been con consulting extensively uh, both in sport and and business has been uh, dan coyle's book on the culture code 
Okay. So looking at extraordinary teams, and that's a brilliant read because you're not looking just at sports teams, but business teams, academic teams, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, cutting edge uh, software teams, r- right through to Navy SEALs, uh, through to restauranteurs on what are some of those ingredients that just make for extraordinary teams. So the culture code and building culture um, is an incredible one. And yeah, and then out, uh, yeah, another one, Zach Zimdar, um, the Madonna of Excelsior really keeps me on in the cutting edge of the new South African space. So enjoy, yeah, it's a, a leaning and a passion of mine. Is, is being part of the new South Africa. I also find myself playing an instrumental role as a mentor and as a shaper of teams that are multicultural in nature. I need to know people's origins. I need to know different thinking paradigms. I need to be reflecting and constantly adjusting my own. So I read widely. So as we say, we're doing sports psych, but how does one dive into the South African psyche? Yeah. It might not be in the sports psych book, but it's in some of our other literature to understand us. Yeah. Um, so I think you have to read in a few different spaces to be effective in, in helping and communicating with people. In such a diverse country like ours, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Ian, thanks so much. Uh, just uh, just if people want to reach you or, or find you on social media, how can they do that? So Nick, thanks for that. So um, on my name under Instagram or Think Sport and Think is with a C, so T-H-I-N-C Sport. And... Uh, or they could find me on a Think Sport Facebook page. And um, you have your, your private Instagram. You're not using that for business? or So they can reach me on my private Instagram. Or um, yeah, they could email me at coach at thinksport.net. Um, yeah. Cool. Brilliant. And thank you so much for your time. I really my appreciate it. My absolute pleasure, Nick. Awesome. The time fly there. What, were you on an hour and a bit or so? Yeah.